Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are going through the book of Esther for our season of Lent as we make our way to the cross. Good Friday. Good Friday service is at 6.30 p.m. here at Walden Church, and then we'll have three services Easter morning, 7, 9, and 11. Um, when we last left Esther, she had been hiding her identity as a Jew from her husband, King Xerxes, for many years, but now she has a dilemma. She has to reveal to her husband her true identity because now all of the Jews are in danger of extinction because of a new law the king has passed. And just to give you a little insight, maybe some backstory into the kind of guy that Xerxes is, history says one time uh, as Xerxes was building his army for the Greek invasion, he enforced a draft throughout the entire empire. And among those who were drafted were five sons of Pythias, who was a high Persian governor. And so, because of his good standing with the king, his relationship, Pythias humbly requested that his eldest son be allowed to stay home as his heir. Surely, sending four sons to battle instead of five would be okay. It was not okay. Xerxes took offense. He believed that Pythias doubted his success in the war, and Xerxes reportedly had Pythias' eldest son cut in half, and he displayed the corpse on either side of the road, and he marched his army in between the boy on the way to war. This is who Esther is married to. This is a man she is about to confess a secret to. But as dangerous as Xerxes is, Esther knows that it's actually safer to be on God's side. Right after she revealed her plan, she told Mordecai, her father, I'm going to go to the king unannounced, and if I perish, I perish. Right now, Esther is acting on faith. She believes in the God who once told her people, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Esther believes the promises. And so she invites her husband to accompany her at two different dinners in his honor. The first meal we read about last week, and now here we are in Esther chapter 7, and we're finally going to see what happens at the next meal. I'm, I'm sure Esther has planned out exactly what she's going to say, right? I mean, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd rehearse it over and over again in your head. You'd anticipate what Xerxes would say and how he's going to react and anything he might ask. And she knows this is not going to be an easy discussion. It might have been easier a long time ago, but not now. Have you ever had something that you really feel like you had to tell somebody, but you were just scared about how they would react? It feels like the timing is Never write, so you just keep waiting. But the longer you wait, the more awkward it is to bring it up. I'm sure that's exactly how Esther feels now. Esther chapter 7 says, So the king and Haman went into feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Didn't you ever wonder what Xerxes thought Queen Esther was going to ask for? I mean, he seems so over the top here in this moment. It's like, whatever you want, right? And you almost wonder, like, does he not think she's going to ask for something big? Is this all a show? Is he just like, you know, just going over the top, or does he really mean it? Does he, does he think she's just going to say, you know, something silly, like that she wants new shoes or you know, new clothes, or, hey, honey, I need you to remodel the bathroom? Esther treads very lightly here. Verse 3, it says, Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. You can feel the, the respect here, right? And a, maybe a little bit of fear and trembling in her voice. And I think by now, Xerxes can tell 
she's not asking for a remodeled bathroom. Esther says, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. What does Esther finally ask for? She asks for her life. That's how she begins. She makes it personal first. She says, my life and the life of my people. She said, if we had just been sold into slavery, I wouldn't even be bringing it up. And now Xerxes is very confused. What is she talking about? Who would do such a thing? And I, I think what Esther has done here is perfect. It's, it's masterful, actually, because I would bet that Xerxes is now starting to feel angry. I mean, who would dare threaten his wife? But he's not getting mad at Esther. In fact, he's not sure who to be mad at yet. Then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? Oh man, she has him now. This is all she needed to hear. Can you imagine how differently this would have gone down had she just come out and attacked Haman directly? Like if she had started with, honey, why did you allow Haman to make a law to kill all the Jews? That was dumb because I'm Jewish. What? You're Jewish? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you never asked. See how that would have placed the blame on Xerxes. So Esther can't do that. That approach would have probably gotten her killed. Verse 5 says, Then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who has done, dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Oh, man. I can just imagine Esther's finger across the table, pointed at Haman just as he's like about to eat. It's like every courtroom scene where the attorney asks the witness, and do you see the killer here in this courtroom? And can you point him out for all of us? And Esther says, a foe, an enemy, that wicked man. This is the moment. This is the moment the reader has been waiting for. Haman is gonna get what he deserves. So this seems like a really good place to hit the pause button. Remember when we met Haman? We didn't even know who he was. Mordecai had just stopped an, a plot to kill the king. And we all thought, well, Mordecai is going to get rewarded. Haman steps in, he gets promoted, and now he's second in charge of all the kingdom. And no sooner does that happen, he gets the big promotion, that he puts the gold sign on his desk, he has the engraved nameplate on his door, he has that new... Uh, parking space up front that has his name painted on the ground. He grabs his world's best employee coffee mug and he begins to walk around the office and wave to all the other employees. And the Bible says Mordecai didn't even look up, didn't even look up from his phone call, didn't acknowledge him, didn't congratulate him, didn't respect him. And chapter three, verse five and six says Haman was filled with fury. Haman's pride was wounded so wounded that he became bent on killing all the Jews for Mordecai's in, indiscretion. Haman wants to kill thousands upon thousands of people because one man didn't bow down to him. It's crazy. But the book of Esther is very revealing about what pride does to us. C.S. Lewis said this about pride. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular, and no fault, which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. It's true, isn't it? When it comes to pride, we're all pretty good at noticing who is proud. We, we notice who the arrogant people are, like Haman, and, and that really rubs us the wrong way. Joseph Epstein is the editor of the American Scholar magazine, and he said, so many people hate snobs. Do you realize that you cannot really hate snobs unless you feel superior to snobs? 
which means that hating snobbery is a form of snobbery. It's a trap, isn't it? Do you know what pride does? Pride makes itself the center. Pride uses others for its benefit. Haman is willing to kill thousands just to appease his vanity, just to make him feel better. <laughs> Good thing we've never done that. Good thing we've never said, well, at least I've never. What? Judge someone else to make yourself look better? Judge someone else to justify your own actions? That's what I do. When I look around and I say things like, well, I've never been on welfare. <laughs> I've never bounced a check. I've never been arrested. I've never been drunk. What are we doing in that moment? I'm using somebody else's failure to make myself look better. This is why we gossip about other people's pain. It makes us feel better about our own lives. This is why we enjoy watching all the horrible things that happen on the news. That's so we can say, well, <laughs> at least it's not me. Or what about when we do have a problem? Right? When I have a problem, I'm going to call somebody and tell them and share what's happening. Friends, friends, let me tell you that with this horrible thing that has befallen me. But then what happens if our friends have a problem and they call us? Boring. We couldn't be more invested, right? We, we don't care. Or, or what about jealousy? And that's just another form of pride. How many of us have ever felt judgment or criticism towards someone who got something that we wish that we had? Whatever it is that you really value, it's hard to watch somebody else get it, especially if you think that you deserve it more. So where does pride come from? I bet you'd never guess. It comes from fear comes from worry. Because pride looks bold, right? Pride looks like confidence, but it's actually the opposite. In fact, we see it in another form of pride, the pride of inferiority. That's when we compare ourselves to others and we come away feeling like a failure and notice all the ways that we fall short. And I think this one is so hard to recognize because we think it's humility, but it's not. Because it's still all about us. True, this form of pride focuses on failures, but take note, it's still 100% about being in the center. It's about getting all the intention. Instead of boasting that we're the best, now we're competing for who's the worst. You think you got it bad? Ha, huh, listen to this. You think you're sick? <laughs> I'm sicker. You think you're sad? Ha, <laughs> I'm sadder. You think you're lonely? I'm lonelier. It's still about us. And it's still a form of using people. It's still us trying to reach for the center, to be the center of attention. The book of Proverbs says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. See, the goal is humility. That's when we recognize that we are not the center, that it's not about us. It's not up to my spouse to make my life better or to please me. I don't live so that others can praise me. I don't need attaboys and pats on the back. My name doesn't have to be spelled correctly in the program. Humility says, my value as a person doesn't come from how good I am or how horrible I am. C.S. Lewis again, he says that humility is the state of mind in which you could design the best cathedral in the world and know it to be the best and rejoice in the fact without being any more or less or otherwise glad at having done it than you would be if it had been done by another. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to run away from pride at all costs because of what it leads to. Right now, Haman has built a 75-foot pole so that he can publicly execute one person. Very elaborate way to kill a person. A lot of work go, went into this just because his pride is wounded. But 
When pride comes, then comes disgrace. And that is what's going to happen to Haman. Because Xerxes knows now. What's he going to do? It says, And then the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. Xerxes doesn't know what to do. One minute he's having a meal with the people, the two people that he's the closest to, and it's revealed that, okay, one has an issue with the other, and he's in the middle. What does he do? He gets up from the meal, and he storms out, and he leaves Haman and Esther there alone. That's awkward. Well, Xerxes has a lot to think about. What's, what, what should he do? Somehow he needs to make both of them happy and fix this. More than anything, he needs to save face. I mean, maybe he can just punish Haman and everything will be forgiven. And I suppose in this moment, Haman could have followed Xerxes outside. He could have run out there, had a man to man, right? Oh man, hey buddy, she's crazy. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, maybe appeal to his inner Persian. But Haman decides to stay and plead for his life with the queen. Verse 8 says, And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? Well, that escalated quickly. Haman is just pleading with the queen. But from Xerxes' point of view, it looks like he's attacking her. And whatever Xerxes had decided he was going to do out on the patio, that's out the window. Verse 8 says, As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance of the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows they had prepared for Mordecai, and then the wrath of the king abated. Remember, last week we said that God is the God of great reversals, right? A little small scrawny Hebrew boy slays a giant with five small stones. A woman in her late retirement years has a baby. The lame walk again, the blind see again. And just yesterday, Haman thought, right? Haman thought that Xerxes wanted to honor him. And he thought Esther wanted to honor him with these two meals. And he's now been executed on a pole that he himself built for another person. It's ironic. Don't you think? Haman never saw it coming. It all happened so fast. And in the last moments, he's actually willing to throw himself at the feet of a Jewish woman to save his life. But it was, it was too late. And then the man who wanted so much to be seen, the man who wanted so much to be looked upon with praise, is now impaled 75 feet in the air for everyone to see. Chapter 8 starts, On that day King Xerxes gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. All of Haman's possessions and household are given to the Jew that he tried to kill. Truly another great reversal. What's the truth? The truth is, there is no future for our pride. There is no future for our longing to be the center, to be in the spotlight, to be the star. Habakkuk 2 says, Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts, the people's labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. God says one day the glory of the Lord will flood the earth and it will quench all of the fires of humanity. 
So if you're living for fire, you are living for nothing. I don't want to end up like Haman. Is there hope for people who wrestle with pride? Of course. And in that, I think we would look to Jesus. Philippians 2, Paul says, Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God. Here, Paul contrasts how we should act with Jesus. And he says, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Jesus looked to the interests of others even though he was God. Meaning, in heaven, he really was the center of the universe. He really was the focus of all things. And if anyone had the right to use people or to exploit people, it was Jesus because he made the people. But instead of clinging to glory and showing up on a white horse with a flowing kingly robe, Paul says he, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied of himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. Jesus told his disciples that even though he was a king, he came to serve. Jesus told Peter, even though I am the master, I choose to wash your feet. And Paul says, be like that. Humility is emptying yourself and becoming a servant, looking to the interests of others. Jesus was the true center, and he stepped away from the center to die on the cross. And instead of using people for his good, he took on flesh and blood, and he did everything for the good of others. How tempting it must have been to act on his flesh, to punish those who made life difficult for others, to wipe out, just wipe out the enemies of his people. You and I were never meant to be the center of the universe, and we struggle with it. Whereas Jesus is the center of the universe, and he voluntarily walked away from it. When Mordecai insulted Haman, the Bible says Haman went home to discuss it. In Esther chapter 5, it says, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and brought his friends and his wife, Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Haman lists out all the things that he is in danger of losing the things that he loves the most, the things that he is living for, his splendor, his riches, his large family, his promotions, his trophies. Haman is living for things that will not last. Right now in my garage, there are boxes of old kids clothes and board games we don't play anymore. And of course, if I were gonna be honest, there are probably things in every single room that are just collecting dust. Things I am holding on to, but no longer use. I've spent my life collecting things that I cannot take with me. How many of us have built a life out of career or comfort or pleasure? And then when the threat of death comes, we see what really matters. In fact, everything that you and I are struggling with, everything that we're fighting for, everything that we're living for, Jesus walked away from the most humble person to ever walk the earth was God. Truly another great reversal, isn't it? You and I trying to reach higher and higher, and Jesus had the highest place, and he came and he got as low as he could. And Paul says, be like that. 
Paul says that's what humility looks like. Like Haman, Jesus was also lifted up on a pole, wasn't he? For everyone to see. See, but Jesus' death wasn't meaningless. And it wasn't for naught. It was for you. He didn't die because of his own crimes. He died for our crimes. First Peter says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. In fact, it was our pride. It was our pride to be the center. It was our willingness to use others for our benefit that nailed Jesus to the cross. The truth is we don't deserve that promotion. We don't deserve our name in lights. We don't deserve slaps on the back or congratulations. We don't deserve a doting spouse. We don't deserve riches or obedient children or a boat or a vacation or a retirement. We deserve the cross. We deserve death. Haman deserved death and he threw himself at Esther's feet and he desperately begged to be saved. But there was no grace and there was no pity for him. Our humility comes from knowing that even though we deserve death, Jesus saved. Jesus took pity. Jesus offered us his grace. You know what I think? I think the reason why we're all trying to get to the center is because we're afraid that if we don't get there, somebody else less deserving will get there first. You don't have to worry about that. Only Jesus is worthy to be in the center. And he is the only one who is there. And Hebrews 13 says that with him there in the center, he will never leave you or forsake you. So let the beauty and love and worth overwhelm you. Let his power and majesty and glory entrance you. Let his kindness and mercy wash over you. Let his promises protect you. And let his resurrection from the dead give you hope. He is the center. He is the center. And life is so much better when we realize that. Let's pray. Lord, in thinking about the characters of Esther, each one so unique, each one playing a part, we are reminded of Haman's arrogance, his vanity, his pride, and we are asking that in all the ways the world tries to make it seem like it's all about us or that the world spins around us or that we're somehow the star of our own show, if we could follow Jesus and walk away from that. Walk away from trying to be the center. Walk away from the spotlight, from the congratulations, for the adoration and for the praise. We don't need those words of affirmation from others. We just need them from you. We need to live for you, putting you at the center of all things, where you belong, you on the throne of my life, you on the throne, leading the church for your kingdom come and your will be done. I want nothing to do with vanity or arrogance or self-centeredness or pride or ego. I do not need to look for ways to spin the conversation back to me. I don't need to list all my accomplishments. I don't need to hear other people list my accomplishments, nor do I need to brag about all of the life that is ill and has befallen me. In this short time that I am here, in this brief whisper that I am alive, may my life be, the, be there to serve others, to live for others, to put them and you first and to recognize the good grace that has been given me. 
the mercy and the pity that has been given me. For even though I deserve death, your son's blood saved me and set me free. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us for another uh, sermon about Esther. Of course, we'll have a couple more. We'll even talk about Esther as we celebrate Palm Sunday. So we're looking forward to that too. Hope you have a place to worship on Easter morning. And if you have any questions, you can always go to waldenchurch.com. Thanks guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.